Number three, Tetsushi Yanagida. On Saturday, June 14th, 2008, Television Miyazaki, a Japanese television network, broadcasted its regular live programming. The highlight of the day was a game show segment situated in the secluded rice fields of Takachi Hocho. The concept was simple. Contestants stood back to back on a petite wooden platform suspended above shallow murky water. Upon a signal, they endeavored to push their adversary into the water without rotating. The individual left standing on the platform emerged as the victor, while the defeated participant faced the humiliation of being covered in mud. The initial round unfolded seamlessly, featuring the defeated contestant adorned in a dense layer of brown sludge, embodying the peculiar and energetic charm characteristic of Japanese game shows. The thrill heightened when the contestants successfully persuaded one of the show's hosts, Tetsushi Yanagita, to participate. After some kikiing, Tetsushi reluctantly agreed to compete. However, as the round kicked off, it became apparent that his chances were slim. Losing his balance almost instantly, Tetsushi responded by plunging headfirst into the shallow muddy water, resulting in a hauntingly still body. The water he dove into measured a mere six inches in depth, with the remainder consisting of a vicious layer of mud. Tragically, his head collided with the mud, inflicting a severe neck injury that left him permanently paralyzed from the neck down. While the accident itself was heart-wrenching, the most disconcerting, disturbing part transpired immediately thereafter. Unaware of the severity of Tetsushi's injury, the crew mistook his condition for a prank and opted to abandon him with his face submerged in the water. Oblivious to the fact that he was engaged in a desperate struggle for survival, slowly drowning in the mere six inches of water, they proceeded to push his face even deeper into the mud. The agonizing ordeal persisted for a harrowing 15 seconds before they finally raised Tetsushi's face from the water. Regrettably, the respite was fleeting as they promptly returned him to the mud, face first. The unsettling scene is heightened by the exaggerated and uproarious laughter emanating from those in proximity, completely unaware of the gravity of the situation. Ultimately, after an interminable duration, Tetsushi was lifted above the water and the camera returned to the main broadcast, putting an end to both Tetsushi's distress and alleviating the viewer's discomfort. Through a stroke of serendipity, Tetsushi managed to endure, though just barely. A few additional seconds immersed in the mud could have proven fatal. Beyond the immediate shock of the incident and its outcomes, there exists a tangible possibility that his injuries could have been less severe, or perhaps he might have escaped without enduring permanent damage, had the situation been promptly recognized. A single person overseeing proper safety monitoring could have made a significant difference. Our first story, thankfully, does end with a somewhat positive outcome. Tetsushi not only survived the accident, but also found the strength to adapt to life, albeit with comprehensive paralysis. Number 2. Gary Plowshay In the early 80s, there lived a man by the name of Gary Plowshay, whose life took an unimaginable turn when his 11-year-old son, Jody Plowshay, became the victim of a predator by the name of Jeff Doucette. For context, Jeff Doucette was Jody's karate teacher and was a frequent visitor of the Plowshay home. On the surface, everything related to Jody's hobby seemed fine, great even. Jody was regularly entering tournaments and winning trophies. Gary and his wife, June, were separated at the time. Still, they were committed to co-parenting the best they could, so their kids exploring their interests and having good performance was quite the relief. However, there was more than what meets the eye, for they did not realize that Jeff Doucette had much more sinister intentions with their son. As predators typically do, Jeff slowly tested the waters with Jody's boundaries, consistently pushing the grooming process and becoming more and more friendly with the Plowshay household. On February 19th, 1984, Jeff asked the family if he could take Jody back to his house to show him something. Since Jeff was a family friend of the Plowshays at this point, they thought nothing of it and happily approved his request. As day turned to dusk and time swept away and Jody still had not returned home, June became frantic. 
She hysterically dialed family, friends, anyone she thought might know of Jody's whereabouts. Her son and his karate instructor had vanished. Then, one frightful night, about a week later, Jeff Doucette allowed Jody to take a collect call to his mother, June. Little did he know, the FBI had tapped the phone line and traced him. It was revealed that the call came from a motel in Anaheim, California, where Jeff had sexually assaulted, violated, and molested their beloved son. Doucette was arrested on February 29th. Shortly thereafter, thankfully, Jody was returned to his family in Louisiana. On March 16th of 1984, Jeff was transported back to Louisiana for his trial. Upon his arrival to the Baton Rouge Metropolitan Airport, police officers escorted him in handcuffs through the airport. Unbeknownst to him and the officers, Gary Plouchet was close by, seeking retribution. An employee of the local ABC affiliate, WBRZ-TV, had informed Gary of Jeff's arrival time at the airport, which was 9.30 at night. A news crew from WBRZ had set up cameras to record Jeff's arrival. In an attempt to remain incognito, Gary disguised himself with a baseball cap and sunglasses. As Jeff was being escorted through the airport, he passed the news crew recording the scene. Without recognizing him, he walked right past Gary, who swiftly pulled out a firearm and fired at the right side of Jeff's head at point-blank range. Jeff collapsed to the floor while officers quickly restrained Gary, asking, Why, Gary? Why? The entire ordeal was captured on ENG videotape. Due to the nature of the video, I cannot share the full thing, although it is easy to find through other sources on YouTube. Jeff Doucette lapsed into a coma, and on March 17th of 1984, succumbed to his gunshot wound and lost his life. Plouchet was sentenced to seven years suspended sentence, with five years probation and 300 hours of community service after his defense team argued he was driven to a temporary psychotic state after learning of the abuse of his son. Several years later, Plouchet gave an interview where he proclaimed he did not regret killing Jeff and would do so again. What do you think? Was Gary justified? Let me know in the comments below. Before we move on to our final segment of today's video, I would like to say thank you for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and hit that bell to always stay up to date on my latest videos. Moving on. Number 1. Christine Chubbuck Christine Chubbuck, an American television news anchor, became infamous following a tragic incident during a live broadcast in 1974. Her legacy has spurred ongoing discussions about broadcasting ethics, media ethics, and mental health. Born in Hudson, Ohio in 1944, Christine grew up as one of three children to Margarita Pegg and George Fairbanks Chubbuck. Early on, signs of depression emerged during her time at Laurel School for Girls in Shaker Heights. Despite her intelligence and academic success, Christine, with a self-deprecating sense of humor, formed a club for girls struggling to secure dates on Saturday nights, known as the Dateless Wonder Club. Moving on to Miami University and later completing her degree in broadcasting at Boston University in 1965, Christine embarked on a career in journalism. Despite facing hardships, she emerged as a dedicated journalist with a dark sense of humor. However, her mental health continued to decline, with her family spending substantial resources on psychiatric help. In hindsight, her brother Greg believes she suffered from bipolar disorder and depression. Christine's professional journey included reporting and anchoring for various television stations in Ohio and Florida. Despite her talent, she battled self-doubt and frustration with sensationalism in the industry. Her struggle with loneliness, unrequited feelings for a co-worker, and the high-pressure nature of her job added to her challenges. In addition, Christine harbored a desire for a family but health issues posed a time constraint. On July 15, 1974, Christine arrived at work, seemingly in good spirits. After some time talking on air, she ended her broadcast with the following. 
in keeping with Channel 40's policy of bringing you the latest in blood and guts, and in living color, we bring you another first. An attempted Christine then abruptly pulled out a revolver during a live broadcast. I will now play the audio for you. Viewer discretion is advised. In keeping with the WXLT practice of presenting the most immediate and complete reports of local blood and guts news, TV40 presents what is believed to be a television first. In living color, exclusive coverage of an attempted At first, many viewers and fellow newscasters thought this must have been a prank, some dialing the station and others dialing the police. Emergency services promptly arrived, but Christine passed away just 14 hours later. She was only 29 years old. The footage of the live broadcast has never been publicly released, leading to various speculations about its whereabouts. Christine's story remains a tragic reminder of the complexities within the field of journalism and the importance of empathy and understanding in our interactions with others. These horrifying incidents caught on television serve as a stark reminder for the unexpected twists that life can take. Live broadcasts and the silver screen have witnessed it all. If you found our exploration intriguing or spine tingling, make sure to hit that like button, subscribe for more content, and share your thoughts in the comments below. Stay vigilant, stay aware. Thank you for joining us on this unsettling expedition into the darkest corners of televised history. Until next time, thank you for watching, and stay safe out there.